When the Buddha teaches the 16 steps of breath meditation, he divides them into four sets of four, called tetrads. The first tetrad deals with the breath directly, the second with feelings, the third with the mind, and the fourth with dhammas. These correspond to the four frames of reference for establishing mindfulness. And the theme all the way through is the interaction between breath, feelings, mind. And some of the emphasis is on how the mind can have an impact on the breath, how it can shape feelings. And others, it's how feelings and the breath can have an impact on the mind. The last two steps in the second tetrad. When you're sensitive to metal fabrication and try to calm metal fabrication, you're breathing in such a way, you're using feelings and perceptions in such a way to calm the mind down. On the third tetrad, we're focusing directly on what kind of states you want the mind to have. And there are two ways of reading the third tetrad. The steps are these. First one is you breathe in and out sensitive to the mind. Second one is you breathe in and out gladdening the mind. The third is you breathe in and out concentrating the mind. And the fourth is you breathe in and out releasing the mind. Now it's not the case that you do this after having dealt thoroughly with the breath or dealt thoroughly with feelings. After all, as you're meditating, the mind is right there all the time giving the orders from the very beginning. And then being developed from the very beginning. And you want to make sure it's being developed in the right way. So you focus on the different tetrads depending on what the problem is. If the mind is, has trouble settling down, is it because of the breath? Is it because of feelings? Or is there a problem with the mind itself? So while you're focusing on the breath, you've got feelings right here, mind right here. And you want to keep an eye on all three. This third tetrad gives you some ideas of what the general direction should be that you want to take the mind. And there are two ways of really reading these steps. One is, as you're sensitive to the mind, sometimes you see it needs to be gladdened, it's depressed, or it's sleepy, it needs energizing. So you try to breathe in a way that energizes it. This is where you use direct thought and evaluation to work with the breath energies in the body. Or to bring up another topic that you find gladdens the mind. You can think about your virtue, you can think about your generosity. Because after all, an important part of the meditation is you're providing the mind with an alternative to sensual pleasure. As the Buddha says, we go for sensuality. The pleasure is a sensuality because we think they're the only alternative we have for pain. So we want to make sure that the mind realizes, okay, there's this alternative. And if the mind needs to be gladdened, if it needs to be energized, okay, breathe in a way, think in a way. That gives it more energy. If, on the other hand, it's already too frenetic, already too wired, then you want to breathe in a way that steadies it. Think in a way that steadies it. Your thoughts about death may help. Realizing that you don't have much time. Even if you live to be a hundred years, when the hundred years are up, there's no time. It's all gone. As I say, time eats up living beings as it eats up itself. It's not the case that as time passes, you just get more and more and more time to wander around in. Because your memories of the past are very unreliable. And especially as you get older, they get more and more unreliable. 
time closes in on you. So you're ready to go. If the mind has been wandering around, this is bracing. Makes you stop. Realize you've got work you've got to do right here, so you've got to get focused right here. And finally, if you see the mind needs to be released from certain burdens, you learn how to think in ways, breathe in certain ways that release it. So that way of reading the, the four steps in this tetrad is basically a set of alternatives. Once you're sensitive to the state of mind that it's out of balance in one direction or another, you work with it in a way. You work with the breath in the way you work with feelings in a way. It will bring things back into balance and help the mind let go of its burdens. Another way of reading those steps is in a consecutive order. Just get sensitive to where your mind is right now. And the first step is to gladden it here again, and direct a thought and evaluation. The Buddha talks about gladdening the mind through the practice of generosity, through the practice of, of virtue. But you can use your direct a thought and evaluation to have a lot of fun with the breath, to play around with the breath. Just as generosity provides you with lots of opportunities for you exercising your ingenuity in, in the world outside, practicing the Dharma in a way that gives rein to your ingenuity. Direct a thought and evaluation with the breath. Allow you to be as ingenious as you can, as ingenious as you want. Working with the breath energies to bring balance to the body. If things are out of order in the body, if there's a particular illness, okay, this is the time to use your direct a thought and evaluation. Work with the breath energies. Think of the breath coming in and out in ways that you hadn't thought of before. Coming in from the back, coming down through the head, coming up through the soles of the feet. Moving around in various layers. All kinds of ways that you can think of playing with the breath. But you have to realize that this is good up to a point. Because you read the stages of jhana. You start out with directed thought and evaluation, and then you let them go. That third step in the tetrad, concentrating the moment, can be read as corresponding to the second jhana. For it begins with the second jhana when you finally get, give rise to a sense of pleasure and rapture, not through thinking about good dharma topics that are excluded from sensuality. This is a pleasure and rapture that's based on concentration. You're focused. You stop talking to yourself about the breath, aside from just the, the mental note that you're going to stay with the breath if you can use an image or a word. But all the sentences, all the ingenuity, all the inner chatter can be allowed to fall silent. It has to be allowed to fall silent if you really want to see things. Because you're constantly talking to yourself. It's like sitting in a room, hoping to hear the sound of the mice in the walls, so you can catch the mice. But you're talking to yourself all the time. You're not going to hear anything. Or the sound of your voice is going to obscure a lot of the things you otherwise would hear. So it's good to have a sense of enough with the direct of thought and evaluation. Tell yourself, okay, that's enough entertainment for right now, enough curing the body right now. You have to give the mind some time just to be on its own. So it can watch itself clearly. And it does this best if it's really, really still. It's like looking at your reflection in some water. Even if the waves are pretty waves in the water, they get in the way of seeing things clearly. You want the water to be perfectly still, the surface to be perfectly flat. Think of a John Lee's image. It's like looking into a mirror. If the mirror is convex, 
makes you look abnormally short if it's concave. No, excuse me. Convex, concave, you're abnormally short, abnormally tall. You want the mirror to be flat. So when the breath energies feel good enough to settle down with, allow them to be good enough. We're not here working for the perfect breath or the most imaginative breath. We use our imaginations to help things settle down, but we've got to settle down at some point and allow the mind to show itself. But only when the mind can show itself, when you're really, really still with it, that's when you can release it. The Buddha talks about releasing it as it goes through the different levels of jhana. You release it from directed thought and evaluation, then you release it from rapture, then you release it from pleasure. You want to get the mind perfectly still. Again, think of a flat mirror that's perfectly reflective. You may ask yourself, what's going to happen there? Well, you watch. There will be some unexpected things. When you're doing your directed thought and evaluation, you're the one in charge of what's going to happen. But when you allow it to be really quiet, then you're allowed to see, well, what's happening in an unexpected way. Because after all, we're looking for insights that are unexpected. If insight were something you could expect, then it would be something you already know ahead of time. We're looking for the things that you haven't known ahead of time, things you haven't understood yet, things you haven't noticed yet. This is what I said, we're looking for the as yet unattained and as yet unrealized, as yet unknown. And for that, you have to be really quiet with an awareness that's all around. And when you catch something that's holding the mind down, you don't have to tell it. You realize that this is unnecessary. You can let go. So that's a linear way of looking at these steps. These two ways of looking at the steps correspond to the two ways of looking at the factors for awakening. In some cases, the Buddha says that you start out mindful and alert, and then you notice what the mind needs. If it needs to be energized, you focus the, on the factors that are energizing. Analysis of qualities, persistence, rapture. If it needs to be calmed down, you focus on the more calming factors. Calm, concentration, equanimity. In other cases, though, he just treats them the factors for awakening in a linear way. You start out mindful and alert, and then you go straight for the analysis of qualities, analyzing what's skillful and unskillful in your mind, and then making an effort to give rise to what's skillful in a way that gives rise to rapture, because that would be direct thought and evaluation. And from there you calm things down. Once the direct thought and evaluation have done their work, you've got to put them aside. So the mind can be really still. You allow yourself some dharma entertainment to begin with, to lift your spirits, to pull you away from your fascination with sensual pleasures. But then you've got to pull yourself away from your fascination with all the fun you can have with the breath, all the fun you can have with the thinking. So you can begin to see things that are happening on their own. And you can learn unexpected lessons. Because the unexpected insights, those are the ones that have the biggest impact and make the most difference. <laughs>